threatens that her voice may go out, and so I may have to come up with uh, something more standard. You can read your own introduction. Oh, sorry. Good morning. I, I do apologize for the dark Irish quality of, of my voice, but I can say dark side. So, so I, I take this conference theme as a permission to share a dark truth about Sandra Brain. She can spook you to your very core. I could, of course, be referring to her incisive illustration of the far-reaching effects of the Patriot Act on definitions of citizenship, concepts of borders, or what we think of when we say we're safe. Or her frightening analysis of post-human law in which technology makes decisions about humans and not the other way around. Or her argument that our very experience of being human has diminished in tandem with our expectations of privacy. I could be. But no, I say this because in her off time, in the evening, Sandra will tell you the best scary stories you've ever heard. There was one she told me one night about a group of cannibals in a rundown motel in Texas. This story asserts its enduring, tingling hold on my lower spine still, whenever I'm in a motel room, or, or Texas. I bring this up not to contrast it with Sandra's upcoming engagement with facticity, but highlight her gift as a storyteller. Not an obvious gift, perhaps for a scholar of communication policy, but it's that skill, along with her ability to make consequential meaning of information, draw vital links that, what, that went heretofore unnoticed, and focus our attention not only on what changes are taking place, but why and how they come to be, that makes Sandra Brayman's work so important and so widely read. Her book, Change of State, has been a curriculum-defining work in many universities around the world, as it explicates the shift from the bureaucratic welfare state to the information state, a shift she describes as ongoing for several decades, but vastly accelerated after 9-11. In this volume, Raymond demonstrates how forms of visual information change the way power is exercised, and how information policy reveals our current form of power as obsessive, rapacious, and insatiable in its regard for information as explanation, method, and goal. In other more recent work, Brayman charts the Internet's design history through RFCs that began in 1969. Sandra's work provides a rare internal view into the process of technological decision-making as it evolves into policy. The slow development of Internet governance procedures and institutional conventions also reveals the evolution, and sometimes the evolution, of the core concepts of privacy, internationalization, intellectual property, national security, and who exactly is the user. Brayman's work stresses deep interdependencies and intricate systems and relation structures that all but characterize information policy in the 21st century. Information policy is made and remade at every level, all at once, she argues, and directly impacts how we experience our surroundings and ourselves. In this, Brayman demonstrates the rarely considered but devastating logic that links, say, the click of a button to deploy a drone attack halfway around the world, and our own casual click of assent to a license agreement on a piece of software or a Wi-Fi network. Similarly, she demonstrates how that to ask about technological design is also, and necessarily, to ask about international law, property, privacy rights, security, governance, and citizenship. When delving into the digital dark, we can hope for no better guide. Sandra Brayman. Thank you. If you're wondering why everyone is um, stooping, it's because they generously enough made a stool for the toy professors who are my size. <laughs> <laughs> Never one to back down from a dare. Albuquerque. We drove into Albuquerque late for the city and for ourselves. It was early in our journey. Your instincts still aimed at the desert and or New York City. Mine were not yet inclined. Naturally, light rays were blotted or mugged altogether. We chose among raised gases in the electric gear. 
We had thought to have good sewing at the U of New Mex campus, thus had driven straight through in a police car, X, with tires radiated like ice and 11 miles to the gallon. We had between us $200 and a willingness to drive from Sacramento, Ka, to Arlington, Texas, the latter an auto continuity between Fort Worth and Dallas with a fresh fruit stand and at least one well-used copy of The Adventures of Mal Flanders. You dove off the coast, remarking, I never thought I'd be in Dallas on November 22nd. We carried your assassinated friend with his son on the cover of 36 copies times 18 boxes of your book. So, we did want to sleep in a bed, not the car in Albuquerque, and get clean. You'd gone to school there. The correspondence rejecting the gift of your papers was for sale from Santa Barbara for $45 offered by a librarian who later followed us to Eugene, that's in Oregon, where we stole her parking space repeatedly. The book sold for four dollars, three, if that was what you had. We stripped both sides of the street looking for a current education, landed in a cheap motel with space, though no protective ring of semis. A pile of empty cars sat meditating at the rear. In one corner, a small crowd of drive-in victors faced off smoking, shifting. There was a bell, but no need to ring it. Our host salivated already, tuning in his box. He turned his mouth of filed teeth to call into points. His woman, filed teeth, who came and laughed, filed teeth, when he said into points, no wonder we're so well fed. They looked well fed. Our room was dismissed from the others by several Shinto doors. A six-pack and Jack Lennon joined us inside. We must have planned an efficient evening, dined on the road, nor did I immediately have to determine the premises. You brought in the kit to save shaving time in the morning, as always, principled. You stretched your, your receptors and those of the set. I zoned in on the old factory, shell anti-pest strips, lifted every horizontal surface into a grin. They hung every reach or so in the air, the sort that attacks the nervous system of a roach or fly or there were enough in the room to comfort at least a small child. We each differently qualified. You, the fly man, removed rather than detonate the neural mines. Out front, you started a gent in his 60s who walked his German shepherd from the back of the hotel, motel. Jack Lemon tried to seduce Sandy Duncan. We grappled with the resident's surprise. The TV was in color, and so was the rug with its large red bloom near the foot of the bed. You suggested, perhaps it's rust instead, but neither of us knew what would do that that way. I went to wash at the tiny, memory says pink, but probably white ceramic sink on thin aluminum spines, my eyes wandering down to the left as they do, trying not to recognize much of what lay in the corner of our room's dead mice and dirty underwear. They did see the row of tiles curved up from the floor where the blood caked, cracked, and flaked a bit. There was a lot of it. We checked the shower together. It had splashed six, seven inches, sometimes a foot high. All of it not more than 24 hours old. You drove ambulance in North Africa and our reliable timing device. We drank our beer. Jack Lemon did seduce Sandy Duncan. You shaved. With the credits, we moved to the car. On our way to a neighborhood you knew, we talked about, you talked about selling eggs in Albuquerque door to door in the 50s. How beautiful it was. The housewives loved you. You were friendly and your eggs the freshest in town. We slept in the car and picked the next day for support, a sunny corner with reflecting wall. Did sell a few books, didn't talk much, listened to the late pale fall sun to the chatter of jewelers, picked up when the shadows came, visited the Living Batch bookstore, moved on. From a chapbook called A True Story, published in 1985 in the hiatus between my master's and doctorate, 
Um, a few reference in the story for those who aren't of a certain age, November 22, and the assassination is, of course, about JFK. Um, the U is a novelist named Douglas Wolfe, now dead over two decades, um, associated with the Black Mountain School uh, uh, because he was very tight with Creeley and Dorn, and uh, Charles Olson insisted that everyone read him. He was the one fiction book that Creeley published with his diverse press. Um, I think other reference. The Living Batch is a character in Ed Dorn's great epic poem, Gunslinger. Um, I think the rest of it should be fairly uh, clear. Why is uh, the, I'm, I'm bringing this up in the context of today's conversation on the dark side of evidence. It actually is, offers a nice segue. Um, and let me point out that Tasha heard an oral version of that over a clattering dinner table with other people talking. And so in the interest of thinking about what's different in terms of evidence between an oral story and a written version and between a tangible object and the intangible, we'll come back to that stuff. But um, I felt it had to do with today's uh, topic because um, initially this, the title of that story was A True Story. And the first person to whom I read it was the woman who was my oldest at that time living friend. We were in our 30s. She had been my friend since I was five. We were always tight. We lived together. And when I read her that story with the title, A True Story, she simply could not believe that it was a true story. So for the first and only time in our many decades of a friendship, there we are, eye to eye, and she basically is accusing me of lying to her, but of course she won't say that, but I know that's what she's thinking. And I don't know what to say about it besides it's a true story, so for this, so what do you do to adapt? You drop it in the, court, in the sake of the relationship. You just like never talk about that one again. Um, you go on and you publish it as fiction with the title of true story, and it sells out, and only those people who happen to know obscure autobiographical detail about a pretty bizarre figure who they also know is sleeping in the streets and living on the road like that. Might they guess that there's autobiographical detail there? So it's, um, um, but if you were to take it as evidence, what would you take that story as evidence of? You might take it as, um, uh, well, hopefully, whatever t evidence you take it of in terms of writing skill. You might take it as evidence of a relationship with that individual if you assume it's autobiographical. You might take it as evidence of the social impact of an IRS ruling in 1974 called the Thor ruling, which changed the ways that publishers pay taxes on the inventory of their warehouses. They could no longer keep stuff forever and sell one copy of WH Auden a year. For cultural capital, they had to pay real money every year. And so there, go, there goes the remainder. Here comes the remainder industry. There goes publishing experimental fiction uh, and so forth. And the book we were selling was a book that had, it was its first out of 10 novels, crossover from the literary world to the trade publication world. And within months of that having happened, it was Harper and Earl gets remaindered. And we spent three years on the uh, driving around the country, authors have price book sale, selling novels in the street. So you might take the story as evidence of the impact of an IRS ruling. Um, if we were to use it in the courtroom, um, of what value would it be if you were to ask us, why didn't you go after, why didn't you go to the police and tell them what you had seen? Because we certainly believe the evidence of our senses in that environment. We didn't even think about that question until three months later when we were describing the experience to someone who knew us well, and it was sort of, gee, it never crossed our mind, and it didn't cross our mind because we were sleeping in the streets. We were just reputable in that you know, for that reason, we were essentially homeless. Um, and uh, had we asked the question, should we go to the police, would have assumed that we would wind up in more trouble than the people we're reporting on um, had we done that. So with all that said, I have to thank uh, Tasha very much for the introduction, um, Richard very much for the opportunity to think through some of the dark sides of evidence um, for this conference. And I want to start here because this is the topic of a whole other paper in peace. Um, but if you look at the treatment of memory as evidence under current U.S. law, um, this distinction between official, public, and private I got from a guy named Havel. Uh, by official memory, you're meaning things like government archives. Um, that official memory of the state is essentially distorted or completely unavailable. If we talk about public memory, those things that we all believe we have as shared knowledge, about our shared public uh, political lives together, it's systematically undergoing erasure. 
And if we think about the private memory, the memory that you might have in a true story, it is increasingly suspect, and even when you are able to offer that private memory, the rules of evidence in, you, in the US uh, instance, in terms of the legal system, um, force you to basically take the story apart into its constituent elements in much the same way that the body is taken apart in the ways that Greg was describing to us so beautifully yesterday. So if we can't rely upon our memory, what are we relying, relying upon to shape the stories that allow us to identify ourselves with identity and with agency sufficient to act? We have evidence, um, and when I say act, I'm talking about as individuals, as communities, as a state, as a global civil society. We have evidence, we have procedural rhetoric, and uh, what I describe as the spandrels of the state, and we have making evidence as the focus here. Briefly, by procedural rhetoric, I mean that uh, briefly, you can read 550 pages of it if you want, but briefly, um, the argument is that with the transition in the nature of the state itself and the rise of informational power to dominate over power in its instrumental, structural, and consensual forms, and with the uh, increasing importance of power in its incipient or virtual phase, doesn't yet exist, but we know how to make it with the knowledge we have and the resources we have, that form, not yet existing power, now more important than the power I'm currently using or that I'm holding behind my back and could use. In that environment, uh, what we see is the forms of the state, the government we're taught in civics class, the government that's reported upon in the media, is really basically the magician's hand telling you where to look while the real game is going on someplace else. I like the concept of spandrels, which comes from architecture, referring to that space at the top of an arch, which early on was required to hold the arch up, no longer necessary. We keep that space and use it for all kinds of other purposes, including aesthetic. In the case of the state, we are also seeing the forms being used for alternative purposes. I learned this first in South Africa, 97, 98. Um, uh, working with their telecommunications policy with, uh, under Mandela, that in, in a transition society like that, you often see organizational form as a, as a means of rhetoric. That's its only function, it's rhetorical. And by making, I mean that we really, um, in this maker society, we really, in a sense, have come to a maker state environment relative to evidence in the sense that uh, George Bush meant it, right? You're the, we are, we are. The research, uh, the reality-based community, we're interested in research, we're interested in going along after stuff that has happened and figuring out what it is while people in politics, Bush, is just making the reality, so we're always behind him. He doesn't care about the research, he's making the reality. This is also the view of those of technologists who are designing um, uh, new technologies. They're making the world. Why be concerned about policy and research? It comes along afterwards. So these things have taken the place of uh, memory for the, uh, for the state and for the informational state. We're in a period that we might call the evidentiary sublime. And by that, I mean that we are functioning in, uh, this is Leotard's turn, a, libid a libidinal <coughs> economy. He was talking about um, the economy, but I think we can uh, use that phrase to think about evidence as well. It's panspectric in the sense that, as opposed to in a panopticon where you choose the target and array your sensors upon it, in a panspectral environment, you collect information about everything all the time. The subject only appears when you ask the question, making how you ask the question the most important political question of the age. It's pandemonic in the sense that agency can run in um, all directions. It's inescapable in the sense that under current US law, whether you are associated with people knowingly or unknowingly, uh, up to six links that may or may not exist, um, or uh, completely isolate yourself, there is nothing behaviorally, nothing logistically you can do to escape being the subject of, and a suspicious subject of surveillance in this environment. Again, complete other talks if anybody wants to go back to those points. I would call it sublime um, because it is vast, it has irresistible power, these are all uh, OED definitions of uh, the concept of the sublime as a noun, it is an obsolete and uh, an archaic meaning, but I think it should be brought back in this environment, a la George Dyson, um, uh, of the brain. And perhaps most importantly for the subject of the talk today, um, it, it also rings the bell of sublimation, that is going from the solid 
right to Baker without what we ordinarily think of as the transition phases of going through um, a liquid uh, when you change state. This is part of a, of a lifelong, a research lifelong interest in the nature of facticity, and by facticity, uh, I mean um, cultural formation that has these four characteristics. It's a cultural orientation revolving around the fact, whether towards or away, the novelist uh, who insists it's all fiction um, is also oriented around the fact, of course. There are specific social functions for particular narrative forms that present themselves as factual or not. We have detailed and verifiable procedures by which facts are developed and evaluated, and we have institutional certification of facts, of fact-producing processes, and fact producers. Those exist in lots of venues, we can go to journalism and so forth, I'm functioning on those of uh, policy making and of ju uh, the judiciary today. So I've done uh, several studies uh, over the years that have thrown light on the nature of evidence. Um, these are just a few, well, uh, these are a few. Uh, in the facts of El Salvador, this was actually my master's thesis, um, I learned that evidence can provide a cloak of invisibility. It was a study that compared Joan Didion's coverage of the 1982 elections in El Salvador with the New York Times coverage. You choose your sources differently, you choose your evidence differently, whole worlds disappear. It can be evidence can be materially, structurally, and rhetorically productive beyond one's wildest dreams. Um, I learned about this in analysis of the use of information policy provisions and arms control treaties. You always start with a single word like, we're going to verify it, and uh, you know, five years later you've got a 400 page manual detailing your procedures, and there's equipment, and there's people, and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It has been uh, found judicially acceptable to rely on um, hyper-real uh, relationships and conceptualizations in the courtroom. And I learned this in a study of the treatment of labels in uh, US Supreme Court decisions, where it actually it turns out, if you go back historically, that the relationship of the label to the object to which it refers over the course of time moves through all four of Baudrillard's stages of value so that we are now, this was in the 90s, way beyond um, his fourth hyperreal uh, condition and the law is quite happy with that. Um, it, uh, evidence can be used to constitute legal subjects and we see this uh, in the interesting groping for identification of the legal subject when it comes to autonomous networks like those involved in what I'm calling the WikiLeaks complex of a variety of lawsuits and expected lawsuits. And it is, of course, something that is quite malleable when it is in liminal political spaces, and this anti-terrorism law is a particularly vivid example of that. If we look at the state of the fact today, um, we see things like the release of accountability to the facts for the intelligence network. What's that? Oh, um, uh, Congress has given uh, the FBI permission to not actually worry about whether or not the data it is relying upon to identify a target as a suspect, as a terrorism suspect, and therefore some of the subject of uh, surveillance. They no longer have to worry about whether or not the information they rely upon to choose you um, is accurate or not. They were relying upon stuff in a particular database. The database started getting criticized, so, people, so the decision basically was, oh, just don't worry about that. Um, we are seeing the use of cost-benefit analyses as a means of relatively evaluating um, types of evidence. And this is coming out of the executive branch via the Office of Management and Budget, a whole other long talk. Um, and that's one of several means of executive interference into the policy use of evidence as inputs into uh, decision making. We are now in, and I published on this, um, we are now in an evidence averse environment, um, although uh, Obama is uh, certainly working with that in his own uh, ways that make it more complicated than uh, that was a single statement you can make under Bush. It's more complicated now, but the nature of the environment is still what I would describe as evidence inverse that was built over about four decades of statutory and regulatory um, and uh, common law change. And um, we see an intra-governmental quid pro quo. So uh, for many years, if a municipal, say, water utility or uh, an energy utility uh, decided to offer up its information about its customers to the Department of Homeland Security voluntarily, that, gave, that exempted you from any Freedom of Information Act request, bingo. So now you've got a market for uh, evidentiary exchanges, for fact exchanges. I'll give you three of these, and uh, you're going to give me all five million of those back. 
Um, and we see an, um, the uh, intervention in research funding, of course, is a huge amount that could be said there, but pertinent to our interest at this conference, I think the fact that in the Coburn Amendment, the decision is not to support research into the nature of democracy, that isn't something this government is going to do, is a matter of concern. Um, we're seeing expansion of ambiguity in a number of areas, um, which, as I'm watching the clock, I think I'll leave till we come back to them. Um, but, but the real uh, the point of emphasizing all these areas in which we are expanding the realm of the ambiguous is that, is that and this is Brian Masumi's point to connect with last year's conference, epistemological change on this level becomes ontological change. The number of questions needing scientific or technical evidence is growing. So in the courtroom, for ex <clears throat> example, that now includes the kind of thing that used to be just treated as background information or things you could use as assumptions. It includes now demands that you, in certain instances, that you get what you can from the citizen surveillance corps, all the people with cell phones out there and all of that. You have what I'm calling unwitting evidence, um, unwitting from Norman Mailer's uh, terrific trilogy of novels on the CIA, actually worth reading. He did massive amounts of research. But unwitting. So when we can use uh, weather satellites as proof of uh, genocide, um, that is uh, on the part of the people who put the satellites up, unwitting, uh, uh, giving up of evidence. And what's being called the creeping scientization of the kinds of evidence needed in the courtroom. With the result that the gap is widening between what is known from scientific and technical evidence and what's actually known from the experience of our senses, what's known from common sense, from long-standing professional practices, the police don't like this at all because it's not the way that they are accustomed to doing things. And therefore, with few exceptions, most policing uh, and intelligence units actually decline to take advantage of everything that social scientists have learned about how to get valid uh, information from individuals and so forth. Um, and it uh, goes against what we often know from tacit knowledge, and I think the underdiscovered, the undiscussed matter in the realm of tacit and codified knowledge is the fact that tacit knowledge can be wrong. There's this kind of bizarre uh, aroma in that literature that if it's tacit, it must be right. There's a long history, of course, of technology affecting the ways in which we deal with evidence. I love this bit that in 1275, the English said, okay, enough of this living memory claim. We're going to set a date, it's 1189, and anything that anybody claims to remember before 1189, we're forgetting it. And from now on, um, it's all going to be in writing, so pick up the technology. So when each new technology comes along, it's used immediately for evidentiary purposes um, without epistemological or jurisprudential justifications for the use, largely often for decades until there are challenges that require that to be um, uh, put in place. And there's a whole stream of arguments about how judicial requests for evidence and so forth in turn stimulated various kinds of social science research and technological innovation. Of course, a vast multiplication of detection capacities, this really needs no detail, um, but everyone might not be aware of the extent to which changes in evidentiary, the evidentiary footprint as a result of technological organization is triggering organizational behavioral changes. So for example, a corporation that is in the world of electronic discovery is redesigning its internal information communication systems and perhaps some of its task design, uh, job design, uh, and behaviors and communication styles and so forth. Whether or not individuals are adapting their behavior in the surveillance environment is an under-researched uh, area. Um, I'm not going to work through all these points um, again, but these are other things that I think are real key characteristics in of the state of the fact uh, in today's environment. Um, and if you look at what, uh, what are we to do with all the scientific and technical evidence if that's where everything has gone. In the courtroom, we first of all see that reference to some kind of evidence as technical is quite flexible rhetorically, and basically it's what somebody claims if it is uh, they think not pertinent to the case, or too trivial, or too specialized, or basically uh, it's a way of putting a black box around something that is unwelcome uh, in the courtroom. We have um, a history in the U.S. Let me mention I'm emphasizing the U.S. as the case. This approach to evidence is Anglo-American. There are significantly different approaches on the continent based in Roman law, etc. subjects for other talks, uh, but that's why the focus on U.S. law. Um, 
so we started um, with uh, in 1923 by saying, oh, it's okay, it was a challenge on the polygraph test. It's okay to use evidence produced using new research methods, including new technologies, as long as those have been accepted in the pertinent field. So now you've got a test, and when you are trying to decide whether or not it's acceptable, it's okay to look at the reputation and experience of the expert who is bringing that information to you. In 75, in the Federal Rules of Evidence, we get a rule that says, no, it's actually up to the judge to decide whether or not the evidence will be admissible. So in addition to is it accepted in the field and the reputation of the expert, additionally, the judge is supposed to look at whether or not enough data was actually examined, whether or not a reliable method was used, and whether or not the method used was used reliably. So now it's in the judge's hand to start um, making evaluations of the rigor with which the research methods were carried out. And then in 93, a, a real uh, world-changing um, Supreme Court case, Delbert, that explicitly defines the scientific method as quantitative and deductive. So for, I imagine, 105% uh, of us in this room, this could be problematic if we're called in as expert witnesses. Um, that a bit, in addition to everything else, that admissibility depends on empirical testing, falsifiability with a known error rate. So it's a world in which you've done lots of research and know what to expect for error rate. It's something that has already been published in a peer-reviewed manner. It's something for which there are certification and standards and monitoring of how the methods are used. So now we're in a very rarefied error, uh, small domain, even within the social sciences, like psychology is rife with well-tested, published, you know, pay for them tests and so forth. But much of even what is highly respected within the social sciences won't necessarily reach um, the last of those. So who's making, who's evaluating all this information? In the courtroom, we go from far back in um, English history and, you know, ideally when you first thought about the jury, you're thinking about small communities in which the jury is comprised of human beings who know the community and its norms and behavioral expectations. They know, they are likely to have known the events being decided upon in the courtroom. They probably know the people who were involved in the case in the courtroom. So in that sense, they had deep knowledge if what was pertinent was local norms and those kinds of things. As uh, society changes, time goes on, we get to basically the job of the, of the jury is to examine circumstantial evidence, which is an abstraction of the earlier uh, approach. And then we get to the jury's um, uh, and I say, and conflicting evidentiary streams, because uh, at this point in the US system, even more than in the British, but in both, um, you have two sides preparing evidentiary uh, arguments, as opposed to in science, where normally you've got one guy standing there and you're trying to attack it. Occasionally you get a bipolar argument that endures over time that it's designed into the court system. So now you've got a lay jury with uh, essentially no uh, most of whom are not likely to have had the kind of scientific or technical training required to evaluate the evidence. And they're getting instructions from the judge before they um, go into deliberations, not only on jury procedures, uh, trial procedures, but on how to think about science and technology. And now with Daubert, you've got the lay judge uh, trained in law who is supposed to be making evaluations of the rigor and quality of scientific and technical methods. When we get into the policy arena, I once actually did a study of the educational backgrounds of all the people in the then Internet Caucus in, in Congress. This would be the late 90s. There were over 180 people in Congress had joined this Internet Policy Caucus because they were interested. Um, they're, okay, there are people without even high school degrees. Um, most people had bachelor's degrees. Most of those were in political science. You've got some English and geography, this, that, and the other thing. I think there was one in communication. Um, that was at very few advanced degrees, it was very interesting, but nothing that would have trained these people to be consumers of raw scientific and technical <coughs> data. However, I'm going out of sequence, oh, it is the first point here. There are a lot of things driving this move towards open data, um, that if you receive federal research funds, you must publish your raw data for in long-lived data archives for uh, knowledge reuse, and um, lots of those are laudable uh, arguments for doing that. Um, uh, but one of the reasons that that's happening and, uh, is that there's all, this, all of these calls among legislators for access to the data themselves because global warming is a good example of a world in which you find a lot of this. 
Why should we trust them scientist fellows to interpret their meteorological data, their bias, give me the data, I'll interpret it. I would call this evidence averse. Um, we have, again, the Office of Management and Budget, um, and political uh, interventions at moments of uncertainty absorption, a, a concept I'm going to come back to, but uh, just as an example of it, when, when someone in the Bush administration orders a climate scientist to change the report on the research findings from a particular document, that is uh, an intervention at the moment of uncertainty absorption. Um, that, that, that moment is when you take a body of evidence, draw inferences from it, however, what, using whatever method you uh, use, and then you pass on the inference rather than uh, the evidence. So these trends are underway um, in the world of fact today, um, uh, in the world of legal harmonization, meaning laws and regulations coming to be more and more like each other across national borders, irrespective of differences in political or legal systems. Um, we have arbitrage is particularly interesting in this area, and anti-terrorism law is a good example of the use of legal arbitrage to effect global um, uh, consequences, uh, and the use of third-party private certifiers, not those of the state and um, uh, uh, not those of the industries, um, in order to um, establish your standards for evidence. It's an interesting trend there. Um, at, the inter at the harmonization level, you clearly see international human rights law pushing towards harmonization in, in the area of evidence and uh, commercial law and other areas pushing back. Um, huge evidence industries, and so one thing I learned when I was studying uh, arms control treaties is that once you open the door on a new mode of uh, garnering of evidence or mandate to use a certain kind of evidence, um, uh, something that has to be verified, it's a one-way door in terms of creating an industry and then creating the industry that consumes that and you can go through lovely cycles so um, what I'm calling the curse of verification that just starts uh, spawning, um, especially because governments themselves start trying to use the tools that they were trying to verify, uh, to stimulate the activities that they're trying to verify, so it's a, it's a loop. Uh, and we're in this world of anticipatory risk, right, that what we are protecting ourselves against or from or trying to preempt is neither, you know, it's not a known, we aren't trying to defend against a known, we aren't trying to uh, deter a set of possible knowns. We're trying to keep a whole world of never possibly knowable, again, an ontological uh, shift in terms of epistemology, uh, and, and never knowable um, set of risks. So in that environment, then the, then the kinds of possible evidence that will be of interest will um, keep on exploding. We have the exceptional, and one of the things that's happened these days, of course, is we're getting used to the exceptional. Uh, the border is one, and there are lots of ways in which the border is not the bright line uh, that we think it should be. Um, and the state of emergency, this room knows this one very well, except uh, just to say, um, I'll point you towards my piece on the globalization of anti-terrorism law, that this really is now normalized in um, laws of every country around the world that the UN could uh, manage to uh, rope in. It was a one-way mandate. Legal differentiation. So you've got this jury system looking at all the scientific and technical evidence that it doesn't know what to do with, and a response to that is this ever more finely articulated uh, way of organizing the legal system so that you've got courts with, or decision-making bodies, or arbitration uh, arenas, or mediation arenas, in which you have smaller and smaller kinds of questions with deeper and deeper expertise. Um, it's already underway, uh, not getting a whole lot of attention, but again, that changes uh, our access to the information that comes out of decision making, how it's used, and other elements that are critical for public understanding of how we're dealing with both risks and um, uh, harms. Um, for evidence, it means that we are increasingly seeing evidence designed for uh, lawyer drip, for co specific contexts rather than designing them for some ideal type of a lawyer-driven trial and then just using those rules in whatever kind of context. So uh, the example I like from 1947 uh, has to do with the treatment of free speech in the National Labor Relations Act. Um, this is actually one thing that got me interested in the, my line of research, working in labor relations in the steel industry and realizing how much of even labor law has to do with free speech. But if in the act, um, it says a lot of things about speech, but one thing it says is that if you are wanting to negotiate about your working conditions, no inference can be made from that 
that you are inappropriately agitating, in essence. So it's a rule about how to make an inference from a certain kind of speech in a certain kind of context. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that kind of context-specific rules for evidence and also for the inferences that we can make from them. Causality has gotten really, um, you know, you're making inferences because you're making causal claims from your evidence. Of course, in this environment, those relationships may be nonlinear. Um, they be, I didn't include this here, they may be non-equilibrious, so that they may reach an ephemeral state and then flip into other conditions when you're, not, when you're not looking or when you are looking, so your evidence may be ephemeral when you thought it was enduring. Um, it may be fuzzy. And it may not be, claims of causality may not be necessary at all. And this is what's so interesting about um, if the FBI doesn't need uh, uh, to make a causal claim in order to go to identify you as a subject of surveillance, you don't need causality. Um, John Ashcroft, who, when he was um, Attorney General, wanted everyone to be looking for terrorists across six degrees of separation, even if that was six people, you know, six flights of who's standing in your airplane seat, is now at a consulting firm that has a way of mapping the missing links. And he's, he makes the claim that there are all these network relationships out there that for which we actually have no evidence. But because if you put this map out there, you can draw these links, we have to assume the links are there, and we can go after the people and the things that are in those empty spaces. This is John Ashcroft. So you don't need causality there. If you're oriented around preemption, you're not thinking about causality because nothing's happened. Uh, we also, the Patriot Act, also um, uh, retroactively criminalized uh, behaviors. So at that point, also, in a sense, causality doesn't happen. You did something you thought you understood what the causes were going to be. It doesn't matter. Uh, Fifteen years later, something else has happened. So we're in uh, an environment that I would call the surveillance citizenship environment. The argument within the arms control arena is that since threats are ubiquitous in the terrorism world, and since the uh, experience of the threat, when it's acted upon as instantaneous, the Boston bombings, your defense must be ubiquitous and able to act instantaneously. So in the arms control, the military arena, they are actually now talking about universal conscription in, uh, for the purposes of cyber war. So what that would mean is that we are all surveillance subjects. We are, it is an act of citizenship to serve the country by giving up anything about ourselves as evidence. We are censors. So if you're out there with your phone by now, you better be taking the pictures. We are consuming the media because that's through consensual power. That's an important part of the organizing, control, and structuring mechanism. We are the media ourselves. Please tweet. We want you to send this along. You are our delegated medium for the government. And we are becoming habituated as subjects of unpredictable and disproportionate exercise of power. Need I mention Boston again? Um, the um, interesting thing, I think, for people in this room with an interest in the media in particular is this issue of uncertainty absorption. The concept of gatekeeping is an old, old one in communication studies, but in, as I think about it now, it's way too thin. Um, uncertainty absorption, as I said, happens uh, when you've got the evidence, you draw an inference, you pass the inference on without the evidence. That's what we do every time we make a representation, every time we create a text or an image or a symbol. There are extraordinary opportunities for uncertainty absorption today. What I like about using that concept, which actually calls to Mar comes from Martin Simon, the organizational sociologist of the 1960s, um, is that it's a, it's a gate for openness. And we think of a concept of a screen, but I like fan better, because if you think of a fan, you've got much more variability then a screen is up or down. You've got different kinds of filtering through the fan. You can position the fan relative to your body in different kinds of ways. So the moment of uncertainty absorption is that moment, a, a, a much more nuanced concept than you've opened the gate or not. It's the moment in which you can uh, choose the scale and the grammar at which you're going to operate, which are modes of rhetoric themselves. It's the moment at which you identify the policy question and so forth. It, it combines all of these functions, filtering, representation, and refraction, which if, you are, if you're talking about absorption, then you are bouncing off uh, in one way or another, that's your um, uh, distribution. So the dark side is the uncertainty reception. If you have, we're at this exquisite, the sublime moment of scientific and technical information being received by people and decisions made by people with no capacity to receive that information. 
We have erasures and false light, not in the privacy sense, but in the, in the sense of chiaroscuro. We have threats to the right to create, the right to be forgotten. Don't worry, I've got a full paper on each of these points. Um, when we're worried about inference attacks, we're worried about dogma. We are, this multiplication of exceptionalisms, I think, is also an habituation mechanism. We have the very interesting, worthy of a, 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 a year of study, the problem of warranty, uh, which, um, how, do we, how do we know that that evidence is what it is? Sandy Stone is actually interesting on this, but we actually had challenges to warranty even from mathematics on, and you keep seeing this arise. Just because that's a business record that came out of that company, how do we know it actually tells us what it tells us kind of question. And we have, not trivially, irrelevance. Because at the end of the day, in this environment, uh, whatever evidence you believe you have garnered to support your case, there's going to be the counter, there's going to be, um, or there's going to be a rule change. Um, and so at, at some point, in terms of instructions for daily living, it's uh, pretty hard to know what to do. There are some tactics uh, in some of these I've got in writing, some are yet to be developed in writing. Um, uh, there are some strategies and uh, um, uh, some of which is also in writing, some of which is not. Um, but I think that the narrative creativity is, remains one of our richest sets of tools in uh, this environment in terms of dealing with this kind of, uh, dealing with the evidentiary sublime. And so one of the things that we can do is to tell a story. Black Mountain. He walked up from below and stood before our door turning a knife in his hands. He was one of what we had thought was a vanished race, low of forehead and heavy with hair. We lived on the edge of what had been a settlement. Dozens of dwellings laid across 120 acres, including three and a half on our 18 and a third. They stood ritually in recline, bored of children's half-dreamt dreams, not the decay of time. Drawn in two by fours, each had an outline of a platform floor, marks for corners, and a door with sun and rays carved overhead. Piles of beer cans lay below. Ours was a mixed design. Wooden goat shed made it to a peeled open tin can trailer. The shed now housed a wood pile, portable toilet, and the toes. Inside, a wood stove heated trailer and its added room with fragrant incense cedar. Up slope, a few yards, the top of Black Mountain. Down slope, rotting hay and steep air filled with vultures. One door didn't fit beneath its sun, and the other wouldn't open. On the ceiling, foil sheathed insulation gave the mice an indoor running track. When he came, he played his knife against his leg and against his fingertips. He came after wild irises burned through Thomas's green fuse, unfurling purple, petal by slow petal, into long afternoons of gentle vigil. It was after stars receded to dim summertime positions, but before the snow that fell on the 4th of July. He came before the toads grew dense enough to trip over, landing on backs that would break with the snap I still wake with, jerking in the night. He came up past the creek, up past the now unused outhouse built by his fellow settlers, seat high on stilts, a sun over the door, and the ground around a floor of scat mixed by the animals who shared their contempt the deer, the coyote, and the hare. When he came, I'd been sitting behind the cabin reading. Already that day, I brought wood from Down Mountain. Already carried clear water from the spring. Done some cleaning, compiling junk spread across mountainside into junk localized. The stove lids, the bottles, chunks of plastic, shreds of cloth. When he came, you were writing. 25 years and a continent away from another black mountain, one you've never seen. I believe he came after the ants came, first one dropping its shiny wings in early spring sun, big, fat, and juicy, full of protein that desert peoples would seek. We sprayed them with our fascination till there were thousands covering the house, enclothing us after we gave up stuffing cracks, filling the night with myriad attentions, Secret, if you truly fear something, it will come to you. They subsided into a new home of their own nearby next day. I know he came months after we learned about bubonic plague, news through nighttime radio of a few miles away and the same ground hogs that surrounded us romping beneath the hot filled sky. He came from a nomadic race, gathered from across the nation and answered to the drumbeat ad of a gay newspaper 
Come to a bisexual community, it said. It will be, you know, back to nature. They come to a nature in its own way skewed, out of balance. Rodents and reptiles, wild squirrels, black or striped like giant chipmunks, bird species the books call rare. It was the end of a railroad line that went simply through the woods from here to there for the loggers, to the cook site, or for miners on their way to Golden Sumter. We'd heard his tribe had traveled on, several to jail or out where the nearest people lived, down from the Elkhorn Range, Blue Mountains, 25 miles across a wide flat plain to Baker, Eastern Oregon, P, capital of the world. We'd heard the land had all been sold, as to your daughter who bought in winter on tour from the Yukon because the trees were big. When he came, nothing happened. He needed a ride into town, and we gave it. He'd been showing his land to some people, then left them there when his truck got stuck. Barefoot women in cotton rag dresses and thin crying children. When he came, nothing happened. But this is not a story about something happening. It is about manner and the West. About conclusions drawn long enough, they wind up in the future, misplaced, repelled by the magnet of the past. We came after the Indians, the loggers, and the miners. We came after the commune, and your daughter, and her husband. And after a while, we left. Thank you. Actually, the surveillance state is going to collapse under, under the weight of complexity and randomness and contingency. Um, as we all have the same technologies back, um, at least I don't see, even give me a long life, I would be surprised if during my lifetime the sort of the, 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 config, the legal, political power configuration settles down into stability. My personal expectation is just for increasing chaos through the rest of my lifetime. Um, and, uh, and but that's linked to the second question because whatever system you look at, you always get question. You know, you always get claims like, um, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna we have this huge database with everything about you, and we can find you. Um, and then you get people who are closer, and then they talk about all the difficulties and all the failures. You know, and so there are obviously there are some successes. And again, Boston, we just saw a success. It doesn't mean there aren't some successes, but. But the, the failures are, I think, part of the, uh, the complexity and the, and the chaos that will, in, in the end, be our savior. And so, actually, if you want to work a complex adaptive systems theory approach, you do get some, but I mean, how much can you put in one talk? But you do get some uh, principles for how to operate in this environment. So, a couple of these, if anybody was at the arms control thing last week on peace, um, we were talking about, so, in, in this environment, oddly enough, uh, being diverse and being different is actually a kind of protection. And I remember Phil Avery uh, in the early 90s um, writing a thing saying he knew how to keep um, his email confidential. He just writes his own little idiosyncratic program and then all of his email is confidential, to which I can say that's great, Phil, but I ain't got your skills. 
yes, I could acquire them, but that's a bottomless pit. But, but there is something about diversity uh, as a protection in this environment. Um, uh, second is the principle of requisite variety that I almost came to today, but that's uh, the notion that at the boundaries of systems you need a level of complexity that's as complex as the systems with which you're dealing. That's interesting to me from an uncertainty absorption uh, perspective because when we do that, basically what we're doing currently with our systems of using evidence is at the moment of, of uncertainty absorption you're having the naive lay interpreter as opposed to the expert interpreter um, so that's you know that becomes problematic. But, uh, thank you for good, two good triggering questions, Alessandra. And, and, and please, those of you, um, if you could t explain who you are, we don't all know each other. question. When I'm talking about telling stories, although I used examples of sort of straight up narratives here, I'm also including the stories that are told when you start moving across scale and treating scale and grammar as your elements of syntax. And so it isn't always so easy to pick up what the story is that you're telling. In that context, I do think there's still a role for researchers and theorists, both. Um, uh, you know, ideas do make some difference. I think this is actually something that we don't discuss enough when we're training our graduate students and when we design our own research agendas, which is how to, how and when to step into the moving water of a conversation and what you think you're actually trying to do when you get there besides get published and get tenure. Now, if you're actually addressing yourself to the conversation, then you get into how big a step do you take, how extremely do you make the argument? Um, in my view, or at least I've made the choice that when I'm making something that is a quite original argument, I will make it actually stronger than I actually would take it uh, to get the point across. And then once it's in the air, then I can pull back to the more measured position. But um, if, if researchers started thinking in that light, then which evidence comes to surface is important. We, you know, we keep forgetting the first books burned under the Nazis were about what? The first books they burned early on were social science research about poverty in Germany they didn't want anybody to know. Hmm. So there is something that, you know, and that's quantitative, you know, that's just straight up numbers. Um, so both with the uh, theories that we put forward and with the uh, research questions that we do, if we think strategically about them, then I think we have those to play. Yeah. Um, I'm, your, your talk seemed to put storytelling in opposition to facts, um, and, uh, and 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 you know I think one of the one of the things that we're concerned or I'm concerned about as a literary critic is um, uh, uh, where you know how we how we judge stories in other words. So there seems to me to be a, a need for um, professional um, uh, judgment of. Uh, Storytelling, the narrative of, of, of fiction, and I wonder if you might comment about that. Yeah, to me, uh, thank you also for the first point, though. This is the first flight of this uh, set of ideas, so any critiques, publicly or privately, I would really appreciate them. Um, and so this is something that I was not clear about. Um, stories are very much a way of conveying facts. It's a different set of procedures for treating the evidence. And for me, putting these together, um, yeah, sometime over drinks I could tell you stories about trying to do literary stuff in social science context. <laughs> I've had lots of experience. Yeah, uh, 
But, yeah, so it's, it's a difference in the procedure, and I always actually said that I did the same thing as a poet that I do as a researcher, what's different are the modes of evidence and the modes of argument. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I want to follow up on, on that. I'm literary criticism also, I'm uh, Jill Caddy. Um, and one of the books that resonates with your talk that I read recently is by a colleague of mine, Tim Melody, a male um, man in Ohio, who wrote a book called The Corporate Sphere. And he's looking at postmodern fiction, but also at the CIA, you mentioned the, the Mailer trilogy, um, and how really all of the most um, absurd uh, counterfactual developments in, in this era of fiction have you know, uh, their real life counterparts in uh, the CIA and intelligence. Um, so, what you have is not an opposition of storytelling and uh, uh, the, the rational fashion, but uh, that, you know, the, the modes of, of uh, fictive and belief in fictions and uh, has, has been carried over into the intelligence agency. That's, I think that's a fair summary of Melody's uh, thesis. And um, it's, uh, uh, I think it resonates with, with, with many of the, the points you're making. And so again, here you have a, a, a situation where the rational is simply irrelevant, or if it's relevant, it's just one part of, you know, of, of so much information that's, uh, so that the, the rational is becoming sidelined. No, easily, easily sidelined. It's just another resource, yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and we see that, going back to the first question, you know, we see this, like, uh, you know, Rumsfeld's uh, famous talk about known knowns, known unknowns. <laughs> this is, I think, what uh, Insumi, I wasn't at the talk last year, but, you know, that's where Insumi has been getting his, much of his uh, energy from analyzing the better of Reagan, the better of Rumsfeld. That's where the epistemological turns into the ontological, and that, too, this is what used to be in the realm of fiction, in the realm of, of uh, you know, uh, speculation, but it's been strong to the public sphere. So it's another move around to that, yeah. So that, that, I think that would, <coughs> would, to, would complicate the notion that, that telling stories is in some way um, counter um, or resistant to um, these things because the, 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 the fictive has already been absorbed, you know, thoroughly. That's a great insight. Thank you very much, and I'll catch you for the site. We can also link this. Let me say something more about the stories. I think it's the, it's back to the uncertainty of absorption. So um, a couple bits. You never remember. I, I didn't work from written um, text. I think of oral speaking as an oral act. But um, uh, there's this, when you read histories of the development of, of the contemporary rules of evidence environment in the US, they look back at the period before they existed, and they say it was really terrible, there were no standards at all, they let people go in this, into the courtroom and they were able to tell their stories. And if somebody had a question, they would ask for clarification. Can you believe it? So, um, obviously we get something different out of that. I think, it's the, I think it's the difference in the manner of presentation, the refraction of the presentation in the story as opposed to let's take the courtroom where even if somebody started with a coherent story about their own experience by the time you get through the way evidence is handled prior to and during a trial that's all been taken into little pieces and, this, and the ability of members of the jury to hold the story together is gone so that's another way in which it's not an opposition it's an argument for thinking about facts and evidence in a way that does allow us to um, uh, to have an identity that, that enables agency at very primordial levels. Yes? As a criminal defense lawyer, let me say that critical, everyone who knows their business knows that critical in a summation, irrespective of how it's been disassembled and how technical it is, critical is the story you're telling to the jury that's going to make sense and one has to figure um, how, how that fits into this narrative that you're going to pull together at the end. And similarly, when you find something difficult, you have to try and examine it from all points and figure out whether it might actually be a key to your story um, and for, you know, overcoming the biases of the jury or the instincts of the jury or something of that nature. 
And that's why we're all calling you uh, when we need help. But I would call that the meta story. <clears throat> so the stories that are fractured are the stories of the witnesses. And then you get the meta story that, that tells, you know, so the jurors are getting a singular story from your. It was a great segue. Uh, the notion of accounting uh, in a kind of earlier moment of print, an earlier moment of capital, was get changed in this moment of social media. And I think that what's interesting about your talk is how evidence is working both sides of those, you know, double column letter or whatever. The last comment and some of these comments have been about how evidence is working in the court, really. But the most striking part of what you have to say is not actually that part. It's all of this pre juridical space in which evidence is happening, decisions are being made, being made, stories are being told, and so forth. So again, I think about Boston, and you know, the courts have barely been involved. And yet, there's been this whole question of finding facts, finding evidence, beginning with the photographs and then moving on down the line. So and then that apparatus then is tied in with things like social media networks, for example, all of everything that happened in the program, the various forms of digital surveillance and so on, all of which creates a kind of shadow, evidentiary uh, you know, world of that happening that, that, in a sense, that really in many ways is more significant because state action you know, and so forth happens before one even gets one. Yes, and I deal with a lot of those kinds of issues in change of state, and an alternative opening for this was the informational state is the invisible state. But actually, uh, and stuff I took out, so it goes even further. It goes into the design of operating systems of computers, because there are differences with how you treat floating point arithmetic that can yield wildly different numbers of the other side of a, the same calculation. And there's the politics of now being asked to put your algorithms forward as if that's the same thing as open access publications or data. So there's that. And in the world of accounting, actually, where it's gotten very interesting since, well, it began with arguments over trade and services that wound up with the World Trade Organization. So it began in the 80s. But a, recon a reconsideration of the standard industrial classification codes, which accountants use to say, this is a table and this is a chair. Um, and so to, uh, those always dealt with objects. And so they, they, there was this couple of decades of struggle to come up with an accounting system that could account for intangibles, for value that comes out of relationships and all the things in the informational cultural world, and they've done that. So it's the North American um, Industrial Classification System, NAICS. Uh, and every time they, uh, and they've got most of the system in place, but still, I've been keeping, you know, every couple of years I check in, there's always space at the edge where they haven't figured out what the thing is yet. And so that's, it's almost like leaving ham radio that you didn't pay attention to what they did because they would push the technologies outward. So there's, there's this accounting innovation opportunity that is designed into the system. And the other thing about trade and services and that that radical change, in our, not radical, but that significant change in our international trade environment is that once uh, international trade and services was covered by international treaties, then the big five accounting firms could operate freely globally. And so there was a tremendous amount of change of the statutory, largely at the regulatory level, that was the result of accounting firms moving across the planet, showing up with governments and saying, oh, you're new in this business, or that's a kind of sticky system. Here we've got a system. And but de facto, they've changed the legal environment by changing the accounting system.
graphic that we're not working about that claims extra capacity points and the Exactly. And that's what I meant by, actually, I think all of the points you raised were mentioned, although briefly, I mean, how many things could you do in one talk, change of state, people have said it's four books. So, um, uh, the last point is what I meant by the complexity. The, um, I've published a, a very fat book on policymakers' use of evidence, so in that sense, I, you know, I would say go read communication research and policymaking to see how it turns out uh, in that domain going back to the 1870s and up, through the, up into the early 21st century. Um, the uh, rules of evidence by agencies, I haven't looked at that, would be part of the book length project, but yes, I, uh, by mentioning the mathematics, there's a whole world of all of that kind of uncertainty um, that I simply felt was too much to get into a one hour talk, but to which reference was made, and I certainly agree with you um, on all of that. There's a, um, well, I should stop there and see if there are any other questions before. Yes, please. Um, the connection of, of the politics and the theory background. A fantastic talk, obviously, as is expected. Um, I was just very interested by your use of the phrase surveillance citizenship. And I just wondered whether you thought, actually, we ought to be more, more careful about using that phrase in the context in which you use it, whether you were legitimating some of these practices. I mean, obviously, yes, prescription is citizenship, <coughs> duty. 
but how far should those duties extend? You know, it's been, it's been constantly surveyed, is that really part of citizenship? Uh, that's a great question. You know, there's a whole, there's all this lovely language in the citizenship, you know, thin and thick and up and down. Um, uh, that was a 3 a.m. decision, so I'll take the critique, although I would hope that <coughs> um, Allen Ginsberg said first thought is best thought, but I'm not convinced he was always right. Um, uh, but perhaps think, uh, talking about it that way would raise enough alarm that it might provide some resistance, but thank you for the thought. So in order that we can keep on schedule, I know Ken and Rita, you have questions, why don't you each ask them consecutively, and then Sandra, if you want to quick answer, and then we can break. I, I, I can pass. We can keep this conversation on relatively close. Anyway, thanks for okay. bringing it. So we've got break time, and then 10.30,